All right, it's uh, 1 o'clock Eastern time here, and it's time to get started with our webcast, which is the Alpha Anywhere demo and q and I'm Dave McCormick from Alpha Software, pleased to be joined by Dion McCormick, no relation, but our lead solutions engineer here at Alpha Software. A couple things you should know before we get started. First, this session is being recorded, as are our other sessions, and you can find those at videos.alphasoftware.com. The second thing is you can start entering questions right now. Uh, you can do that by typing them into the questions box of the GoToWebinar control panel. Your questions are what make these sessions interesting and we keep them going. So let's begin. Dion, I'm going to take you off mute. Hello, Dion. Are, are you there? Oh, yes, I am. Good to hear from you. Great. Well, let me go ahead and make you the presenter. You got it. I have to say, it's good to be back. I kind of miss doing these. Yeah. We've gone for two weeks, and uh, and we're back now. Just but good stuff. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Let me know when you can see A-OK. -okay. Yep, I can see your screen. Awesome. Well, this is Dion McCormick. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us. Um, I have a quick little demonstration I'd like to do at the beginning to kind of start laying the groundwork for all of the uh, sessions we're going to be doing next year, and we'll talk a little bit more about that also. Uh, but again, want to say thank you very much. I hope everybody had a fabulous Thanksgiving and a follow-up to that. Uh, only you should. I hope you're doing your shopping today because we only have like three hours till Christmas this year, or something like that. It's insane. I can already see uh, the UPX trucks. The number I see on the street have doubled. It's just crazy how fast <laughs> that's coming for us. I mean, <laughs> you got to dodge. Those guys are moving fast right now. Anyway, I wanted to say thank you, and uh, as Dave had mentioned, very important is that we really enjoy and, and want your questions, so take the time to go to the GoToWebinar control panel, to go to the questions section, and enter in your questions. We actually have a couple questions we got before the session, which I'm going to cover. Thank you, Dave, and thank you to the individual who sent it in, and that's always helpful. I mean, that allows us to do a little bit more research, be a little more prepared. Uh, and so always you can send to guides at Alpha Software and that will allow us to uh, kind of be ready to go and uh, have some good quality information for people that are looking for it. So if you haven't done that, put in your questions now and we'll get to those in a few minutes there. So uh, just kind of a recap before we uh, went on break there, we had been focusing on the roadmap and talking about the upcoming roadmap of all the different things that are deploying in Q1 of next year, uh, all the new mobile optimized forms capabilities, but also kind of talked about what was going to happen the rest of the year. Just a very full schedule of improvements, capabilities that you're going to find out. And one thing I want to kind of talk about, and this is kind of laying the groundwork for next year. Uh, what you're going to find is there's one theme more than anything else that I've seen kind of where the trend is, and that's with JSON. Uh, JavaScript object notation. And it's one thing that I think really is going to be a critical kind of core skill set that I, that I find for everybody for next year, mainly because as alpha matures, we're seeing what's going on in the industry, and JSON is becoming more and more of an important component of the industry, specifically how you transfer data, how you consume data, how you provide data. It's, it's much better than XML and the previous methodologies. And what I'm seeing is that almost every tool out there is embracing JSON as a method for communicating with other tools, with other services. And, and that shows right here. If you look at one of the key uh, things on our roadmap for next year is actually, let me pop up is mobile optimized forms. And one of the cool things about mobile optimized forms is really what we're doing is we're converting the data into JSON and then templating that JSON into a representation for the user. So JSON's intimately involved with the mobile optimized forms. If you looked under the covers of the alpha list control, that is all JSON data. Basically, the list control brings down data from the SQL server, translates it into JSON, and then, then manages it locally in that format and then, again, uses it to translate it back into the SQL databases. So it's kind of this under-the-cover piece of capability that's part of everything we're doing. And another area which I started to talk about is in the data connectors. Uh, we're aggressively looking at um, Dion, it appears that your sound has gone out. Let me redo that. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, 
just uh, must have bumped something. Is that sounding okay? Yep, sounds great now. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, I don't know where you lost me, but uh, you know, no SQL databases. And the focal point about that is that uh, they're storing the data instead of a relational method more as an object in the database, and they use SQL as a method for doing that. So uh, you're going to see over and over again SQL or uh, JSON is going to be a critical element of it. And there's actually a great series of tutorials that um, uh, Selwyn put together. And my, Dave, I apologize, I w didn't have time to pull that up, but if you could look at that series of videos that just, if you can find that link, where, you know, he had about, uh, Selwyn put together seven introduction videos to JSON. I think there's actually a blog entry on it. And meanwhile, I want to show you some of the capabilities in the tool to work with JSON. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and go over into my development environment, and I'm at my web project control panel. For people who are new to Alpha, this is our development system. Uh, it runs on Windows, and, and it has sort of a Visual Studio kind of capability, but it's chock full of a lot of really powerful tools. And one of the most powerful tools, as you get to know JSON, is the uh, JSON Data Template Tester. You find that when you're on the Web Projects Control Panel under Tools, JSON Data Template Tester. And this was put in there to help you quickly start to use JSON and more importantly is figure out how to do what's called JSON templating. The idea is JSON holds the data, but it can also be very sophisticated and hold a lot of things. But what you can do is put a template on JSON so you know how to display it using HTML and CSS to the, to the end user. And that's called templating. And it's a very key concept because what it does is it really helps you separate the data from the user interface and be able to quickly reuse JSON data with different templates. So you can say it's really powerful, it's real fun, and you can actually have dynamic templates. So it's an area that I really encourage everybody to spend some time playing with getting familiar because once you see how it works, your development cycles will go down and you'll be much more, you'll be able to do much more interesting creative elements. And as all of our new capabilities start coming out next year, you're going to be better prepared. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up and you're going to immediately see that we have essentially a little testing environment. So on the left side of the pane is a JSON representation. And again, for people who are new to JSON, don't worry, it's very easy to pick up. I'll mention a few things here, but uh, there's a lot of really good resources out there that allow you to do it. One thing you'll find is that it's very readable, that versus something like XML, you're going to find this is a very readable, easy to kind of understand capability. So again, if you'll notice on the left-hand side, we have our raw JSON. And just to kind of give you a description, you'll see that it starts with an open bracket, ends with an open bracket, and then has a series of essentially records, each one uh, separated by a comma. And you'll notice that built into the record, it's got the record, uh, sort of the column name, if you want to translate it to that, and then the actual data is here, and then, again, the column name. So this basically has a set of first name and last names is what this holds. And uh, so, again, as you can see, it's very easy to kind of understand and read. And I could go in here and I could just say, okay, I'm going to add a new name. So I'm just going to go here. Copy that. I'm going to put a comma in there, and I'm going to say John. And notice what's going on on right as I do this. As I change the JSON, check that out. It's actually rendering this JSON through a template over here, and I'll show you a little bit more on that. So as you can see, it was very easy for me to add a new record. And actually, what's very easy to create this uh, this from strings. There's actually some built-in functions in Alpha to turn uh, relational data or table data into uh, JSON, a lot of really fun things from that standpoint there. But I just want to show you, okay, so on the left we have our format, or essentially our data, our content. On the right is displaying in real time a basically the rendering of this JSON data through a template. So if you'll notice, if we go up to the top here, we have JSON data, and then we have template, and then JavaScript and CSS. So I'll go back to template, and you'll notice in here we have some text right here. Then we have a HTML directive, which is bold. And then you'll notice we took, hey, first name, and put it right in there. And so the actual JSON data element is in the little curly brackets. And then you have a second JSON element that is last name. So let's say I wanted to say, uh, let's do this. Let's go like this. Let's say first name. So I'm just putting in some static text there. And then I want to put in here last name. Notice what's going on on the right. That 
as I modify my template, it's taking my JSON data and r r putting it right in here. So I go, oh, you know what, that doesn't look very good, so I just want to get rid of that. Or, you know what, I want to say full name, and I want to get rid of this, and now I have to put in here. There we go. Okay. So as you can see, very quickly, I can say, oh, you know what, I don't want this right here. I can go right there. Boom. And therefore, I can quickly not only review my JSON data, but more importantly, is create a template. Now, what's cool is this template right here can be copied right out of here and put into, say, a list control. And if that list control is bound to the same JSON data, then you will immediately see this. So what you can do is instead of having to use a list control to develop your look and feel, you can actually do it right in here and then uh, have a lot of fun with it in terms of uh, you know, immediately making it look how you want it to look. And you can add any HTML, CSS you want, and it will render appropriately. And that's what I wanted to show next is that, so real quick recap is that JSON is just a data representation. It's very easy to read, it's very easy to modify, and there are a lot of really powerful tools built into Alpha that will automatically translate, say, a, uh, a pointer variable into a JSON string, or you can do things very simply and create those JSON strings from that standpoint. The second part of it is a what's called a template, and in this template, basically what we're doing is we're taking and inserting those field items, and so each template is for each record. So you'll notice I had three records, Fred Smith, Fred Smith, and John Doe. Basically, it takes all three of those records and runs them through this template and displays it on there from that standpoint here. Now, a couple other things that it can do, which is really, really powerful, is that we can actually add JSON, uh, JavaScript, so if there was some like jQuery functions or things like that, we can also add in some CSS in there. So I could actually have CSS that's in this template and actually put in here the CSS, so the class, and so that the this would re, uh, you know have the color, the scheme, whatever it happens to be. So you can build very kind of complex, very full templates right in here. And again, the beauty of it is now you just copy that, place it into a list control, and then it's going to render on your mobile device or your desktop or wherever it happens to be very, very quickly. And so I'm not going to spend much more time on there, but I wanted to also show you that this was a very simple example. So uh, Joe Smith. But built into the template tester, we have other examples. So if I click load example, you're going to see we have a ton of examples because really the neat thing about this is that JSON in itself is simple. A template, as you've hopefully seen here and hopefully my description has been accurate, is fairly simple. It's just basically saying, okay, insert the data element here and then use HTML and CSS to style it. But there is enormous, really powerful things you can do because you can have things like nested arrays of values and objects, meaning you could have like client and then contact. And so it really, after a while, you can really do very complex things with this using the basic items. And the best way to learn is by seeing. So I'm just going to go ahead and click simple object, simple template and insert that in there. And as you'll notice, I'm back to something very quickly. I've got first name Fred, last name Smith, and you'll notice it just spits it out there. But let's go ahead and do something a little bit interesting. Let's do a complex object with a simple template. So now look at this. Check this out. You have first name Fred, last name Smith. Now you have this address object which actually contains a subset of items. So this is the idea where you have the top level which is the here, but then you'll notice the nomenclature is I have address, colon, and then in this pair, uh, curly bracket, all these elements. So now I can start having what are more complex representations of objects, meaning a person with their address. And this could be like we could have a second address which is a, uh, you know, um, their work address, et cetera, and, and very, thing, uh, very complex things. And this is when you get into starting to use what are called NoSQL databases, you'll start seeing these representations because instead of saving all this data in a relational table, you can basically save a customer, their address, all in one column, in one table, and call it a day kind of scenario. So, but you can go through these and experiment with these. Uh, you can say, okay, data is an array of objects, so now we have back to what we had before kind of array of different, so each one of these is an object, and then you have an array of, in this case, two of those objects. But now you can get even more information, so you can say, uh, for instance, I mean, there's just tons of stuff that you can do. 
Uh, you can define custom format by, okay, let's go ahead and do this. Now notice this, check this out. This is another cool example, and I'm going to stop it at this point because I really just want to give you a feel for it. But let's look at what's going on here. So we have a JSON object here denoted by the open close, and then we have a employees array. You'll notice that uh, in this case you have multiple employees. You know, you have Fred is one record, and then Laura is a second one. So again, fairly readable. You can kind of see that if you're going to have a array of objects, it always starts with an open bracket and a closed bracket. And then the actual array of items are there, and you can nest these as many as you want. But let's look at our uh, template here. You'll notice that, yeah, it's doing the same thing we kind of did before, where we had an employee name in Fred Smith, but you'll notice it has a header and a footer that are built into it. So you go to template, and now let's look at this. You'll notice that we have, we're saying employees, so it's going to use the employee data there. But you'll notice we have this little designator, star header slash star header. So how this works is saying basically that in this area here, this is what's going to appear, and then it's going to iterate over those array of employees to spit out each of these secondary lines here. And then once it's fin finished doing that, you have a footer here that's going to spit out with the information in this. And this I can just you know, modify it how I want, play with it, etc. So as you can see, you can do some very sophisticated kind of in layouts and, and arrangements using this technology. But it, like anything, it takes a little. You start easy. You go with like, and you just pick up and do a simple object, simple template, and play with that, play with changing this, play with you know, modifying the data. Heck, I could even put in here and say, OK, uh, phone. And then I could go 800-555-1212. So now I modify this object in here. I can go back to my template, and I can go here, and I can say phone, and let's see what happens. And did I break it? Oh man, not that easy. Oh, it's. I think it's actually word of the wise. Uh, always use it's Java world, so always use lower cases. It's case sensitive. But if I go to back to my template, you can see. Oh look, it dropped right in there, and so I can type in here and go phone number. Boom, there's my phone number. So lots of really fun things you can do it. So just to show you how to do it, go ahead and close this out. As you go to the Web Projects Control Panel, go to Tools, JSON Data Template Tester, open this up, go to Load Example, pick an example, put it in here, and then start playing away. And as you can see, you're not going to break anything. It may not work exactly the way you want it, but you can play with it. You can uh, put in some CSS here and add some CSS in there. But once you start getting a handle with this capability, what you're going to find out is that it is going to be, you're going to be using it in ways you never imagined. You'll be really well prepared as these new technologies come on next year to be able to start using them very quickly because you'll find out that JSON is, pervades almost every element of it. Because JSON is such a powerful concept. It's very easy to read. It can handle uh, simple and very complex representations, and everybody kind of uses it now. So there's a lot of resources, training, and other things that are available in there. And uh, very fun, and uh, enjoy that. I think you'll get a lot out of it, and you'll be much better prepared as these new tools come down the roadway. So that's what I had for a quick and dirty demonstration. I um, wanted to turn it back today for a moment and do a process check. I do have the, uh, those questions ready to be discussed, but go ahead, Dave. Yep, everything is coming through fine. All right, all right. Well, we had two questions uh, that came in before our, our there. I Which, by, by the way, if I can just interrupt for a second, you, you can oh, yes, absolutely send in questions ahead of time at any point. Just send them to guides, G-U-I-D-E-S, and alphasoftware.com, and we will get to them. Gotcha. And if they okay. come in first, we'll answer them first, like Deanna's doing right now. Um, I don't have that question up in front of me. Do you, Dave, do you have that question up in front of you? By any chance? Uh, Just, sure, I can find it. If you don't mind. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close out this and get ready to go. Do, 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 do. Uh, so I'm in here. I'll go ahead and open up this. And we had one question about regarding using session variables in JavaScript. Uh, uh, and we can talk a little bit about what are session variables and that's that. right. And there's it, a second question. And, I, and I, can, I can actually read you that question if we want to get Yeah, to let's go ahead and that. do that. Great. So the question is, how do you publish session variables back to the client 
for use in a JavaScript function. So I'm including okay. my session variables in a publish session variables property, but it's not working for him. And, and I found something interesting that I played, and I, I will have half the answer this week, and I'll get the other half as soon as possible. I just need to touch with the developers there. But I built a little example US, UX to talk about this. So um, uh, before I start, I want to just make sure everybody understands. A session variable is a server entity, meaning it lives and breathes and does everything it needs to do on the server. Session variables do not exist in the mobile web browser uh, or in the web browser. Basically, you can't say in a, the, when, when it's out in the field, you can't really directly access the session variables. Uh, so the power of session variables is that it stays active during your session and it allows you to store data and reuse it. So like, like when a user logs in, you can get their name and put their region and their customer ID or client ID, and then refer to that into filtering functions and things like that. But that data isn't directly accessible within the mobile browser or a web browser. So you have to have a way to kind of tell it, hey, I want the, um, the tools to be able to use this session variable. So to show you an example of how this works is I have a really simple button here saying show session. Okay, and what we're going to do is when we click that button, we're going to grab the get session variable called message and then show that message to everybody. So this is a little JavaScript. Don't get too concerned. It's very simple. But basically all we're doing is saying take a session variable called message and give me that alert. Now, for this to work, I need to do something, and this is very important, is that I have to go into, and I'm in my UX control, I have to go to my properties of my UX control, and I go down and find a property called publish session variables. Because you could have a ton of session variables on the back end, but you don't want to have to have all of that available to this UX. It may not make sense. So what we do is we go into the properties for this UX, we open up publish session variables, and we write out which session variables we want to be published to the web, to the um, browser. The idea behind, is that behind the scenes is that when this UX runs, it looks at those session variables, grabs that data, and then kind of packages it up and sends it along with the UX to the browser so that now all the JavaScript on the browser can access that session variable using that special sort of uh, the script or command that I showed you before. So I could have session, you know, uh, uh, let's see, uh, user ID, I could have session dot, whatever it happens to be in here. But the important thing I want to make sure you understand is that you have to specify which session variables are done. And then the system doesn't takes care of the rest. And if you'll notice down here, you'll see below that right here, it tells you how to reference a session variable once it's been published. So uh, once I have set this session.message, I can use this little piece of script here that says get the session variable and then all in up capes that message, the, whatever the name of it was. And so anything that's been published to the client now is available. So let me show you an example of how that works. So I'm going to go ahead and go back into my UX control. I have this button that when clicked, it's going to grab whatever the value of that session variable is called message, and then it's going to give me an alert. Now, the other thing I'm going to do is when this UX runs, I'm going to go to my server side events, and you'll notice, and we're going to do actually a session on what all these mean in the very near future, but you'll notice I'm doing a session.message is equal to hello class on and on dialog initialize. Uh, so what this allows you to do, which is really cool, is that this runs before the, the dialog. It runs on the server before it's run. So I'm basically just doing, for test purposes, throwing a message into the session variable so that w that session variable now exists. And then when it builds this UX and sends it to the uh, client, it's actually going to say, oh, you know what? Uh, Dean wants that message uh, session variable to be available. So I'm going to go ahead and grab whatever it's the value of that at that time and send it along with the information. So let's go ahead and look at how this works here. So nothing exciting here, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and show the session. And you'll notice that it's putting out that hello class, which is what 
I had in my, my uh, session variable. So the session variable was packaged up, it was essentially included in here and sent to the browser. And in fact, we can go ahead and uh, launch this in Chrome so it's actually outside the development environment. And so now I'm con disconnected from the server, essentially everything's running locally here. And when I click select show session, that session variable ha is kind of now part of this local so I can access it. If I had just said like, you know, session dot that, it would blow up because the actual session variable itself lives on the server. So we really don't have access to that. So if I wanted to, I could go in here and change uh, this to be hello webinar. And now I go through the same thing here and it's going to take the state of that and show hello webinar. Now, I did a further experiment. I think this may be where the individual was having an issue. I was thinking, well, you know, that session variable um, is um, a, uh, that it does that publishing of the session variables when the UX is first delivered to the UX. Because I did a little experiment. What I did is I created a new button here called set session. And then what I did is I called what's called an Ajax callback where I made a callback to the server and I I'm calling this little piece of code called set session. So when this runs, basically the person out in the field will click a button. It sends a message back to the server saying, please run this function. And in that function, which I'll show you here, if I go to the X basic functions, I'm putting in the session dot message equal to a new message. And then what I wanted to do, to, I wanted to see if alpha will automatically set that message for me. So I went ahead and did a live preview. So let's look at this first. So remember we hard coded it so when I sit here it's that hello webinar we had. Now I'm going to run this uh, set session here and it's set the session but it's showing the same uh, session variable or uh, it didn't reload that. So just a, and I'm going to double check on this with selling the team there but from my understanding is that when you publish your session variables it's when this UX first runs. Uh, if you need to update the, that variable information in your X basic function, instead of setting a session variable and having it automatically do it, you can actually return that variable information directly. You can basically say that object is equal to XYZ and send that back to uh, the browser. So for now, and I'll, I'll make sure this is correct, is that when you click on set session variables, and that occurs when the UX is first created and sent to the client first time. If you do any AJAX callbacks, it doesn't update that information. Like if a session variable is changed, it's not going to do it there. What you can do is you can other, use other techniques to update that client because you can basically send JavaScript back to it saying update the value of that va uh, variable, the, the XYZ or something like that. But I'm going to double check on that just to kind of ask uh, the folks how that works. Uh, and make sure that I haven't done something wrong. But I hope that explains that session variables live on the server, JavaScript and everything else uh, works on the client, and what you do is by clicking on this publish session variables and specifying which session variables, those variables now are available when the person is out in the field. And the cool thing about it is that we, because we published it, when the person does the to get that data, they don't have to go back to the server. So it leaves complete. It lives completely on the web browser or the mobile device. Uh, so that I hope is kind of answers a little bit of the question. I will find out about that other question in regards of you know can we set a session variable and have it be repopulated automatically by the system. My guess is no because when you're doing an AJAX callback, um, I can by doing this I'm basically sending this command in here. So I can say var xyz is equal to uh, plus session dot message. And so I can take that session variable and put it into a variable and send that all back and this will run and reset up that variable for me. So I think once you've kind of got the UX established out in the field, then any kind of Ajax callbacks you would then do sort of the update of those, those uh, variables yourself. But I'll double check on that and, make, and let everybody know how that's going once I do it next week. So that was the first question. And now we had a second question, if you don't mind um, going over that one real quick. 
Sure. The second one is uh, is a great question, actually, but and a short one. Um, so when deploying a mobile app using PhoneGap that involves database operations, does the app still need to be published to a web server running the AA application server? Yes, because it needs to, you need the app server to do that interface with the database. Uh, so it is expecting to connect through the app server to connect to the database uh, to do those kind of operations and capabilities. Right. You can create a mobile app that calls web services that are non-alpha and that can be essentially a standalone non-server application. And a great example of that is the World Cup app that uh, Bob Moore put together that was built completely as a standalone app and in there it used uh, calls to web services to get uh, World Cup stats and information and bring that back to the mobile device. So, so the other, but the uh, sort of the crux I think of this question was, sure you need the Alpha Anywhere server running, but do you have to publish your app to it if PhoneGap has got, you know, your if it's like a single UX app and it's wrapped into PhoneGap? Well, my, you know, I um, think I think you still do because I think there are still pieces there that yeah, are required. Yeah, the way that that app talks to the database is somewhat configured by yeah. the server. It's talking to the server, and especially if you're going to have like list controls in there and things like that, mm -hmm. and you're going to do disconnected. Well, the app server is doing all of the synchronization of data. So yeah, for DB ones, you really do need to have uh, the app server and publish through that to do so. So you would basically you know, publish your app and then you would build your phone gap that's going to talk to that back-end services on our alpha server. Excellent. A um, couple of questions here. Uh, one is, is the Danby responsive expense app demo available for download? I think that that one hmm. is, but I will need to dig that up. So that's that's actually a really good question. I will send out the answer to that to everyone who applied to the uh, to today's webinar. So so you'll get the answer to that and, and where to get it. Uh, the other one is is the concrete truck demo app available for download? That is not available for download right now. That's a brand new one. I don't know if, if you guys have seen that yet on the blog. It's a very cool one. That uh, very that cool. Together. Well, everybody loves concrete trucks. Yeah, <laughs> so that is certainly good no, subject matter. Nothing wrong we, with that. We've all of a sudden there's a lot of five and six year olds that are very interested in being alpha developers right so now. Suddenly, yeah, I know it's amazing because they're concrete trucks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so let me see the other question. Um, I'm trying to get a follow-up on this, but this one has to do with, uh, actually, I'm going to wait till I get a follow-up on it, but it's the one that has to do with uh, phone uh, real-world experience with PhoneGap and the App Store. And uh, and if you're listening and, and you ask this question, um, I just would like to know, do you need an example of an app that's been published that's real, or are you just interested in what is the experience, how do you go about doing it? Uh, and right. just, just let me know that, I'd be happy to, to handle it. Um, Here's another question. This one has to do with SQL, no SQL. Uh, I said now with SQL, uh, you can have lists and detail views in your UX component. How is this going to be changed with a no SQL data connection? How will that oh, setup be different? Good. Yep. And I think you can yeah, show that if you have Yep. Yeah. And that's where the JSON template, template, or template templating, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Templating get, comes into play is that the idea behind it is that um, right now under the covers when you connect to a SQL database uh, the list control converts it into JSON and then when you're in the list control editor you're basically building a template in there that's basically the little secret that's been going on from there so it's going to work very similar to um, the with the NoSQL from the standpoint when you connect to a NoSQL it's going to kind of translate that for you into the JSON and then you create a template that represents it. So an example of that is what I showed a few minutes ago where you have a, uh, let's say it's a contact and they have a set of addresses. So in a NoSQL world what it does is it stores all of that information in a single record in the database essentially. So you have uh, essentially a one big chunk of JSON that has that JSON representation of a contact and one or many uh, addresses. And so what's great about that is that once you've created your template, 
then it just takes that JSON that came back from the NoSQL, marries it with the template, and then shows it on the web browser to the user. And it gives you complete and total control over how you re represent that information there. So it's going to be very similar to what you see today. We're not going to throw away the methodology. You're going to use a list control. You're going to connect to a JSON or to a NoSQL database. It's going to look and act like the current SQL server kind of our SQL database is there. So all of that kind of sort of path or pattern of operation is going to be very similar there. What you will start seeing is that more and more you're probably going to want to spend your time using the JSON templater because you can take an example road, paste it into our template tester and do a great representation and then copy all that right into the list control and you're done. So you don't actually have to be in the list control doing the setup of what the look and feel is. You kind of separate that from it. And here's another thing that's really, really, really cool about that is that you can work with a very talented designer and say, hey, this is how you would rep this is the JSON and or, you know these are the tags for the different parts of the JSON, like their address, their phone number, etc. They can lay it out in their normal native tool, make it look perfect with some dummy data, and then all you do is change that dummy data over to be uh, the sort of that little curly bracket tag, paste that into your system, and now you have this beautiful representation uh, done by a designer. So it's really going to break down those barriers in terms of creating very beautiful uh, interfaces. And that's a, a core thing that's happening all next year is that uh, the team led by Dan Bricklin and Selwyn and Company are looking at ways they can simplify and allow you to build much more uh, elegant, much more visually exciting user interfaces and do it much simpler, i.e. separate the plumbing from the face of it and allow the people to quickly uh, combine the two without a lot of rigmarole. Right now, they, they were so tightly integrated, just the history of the tool, that it was somewhat tough at times to separate it. But when you start moving towards doing things like um, the JSON templating, then it opens up whole new avenues for you to be able to create that. The uh, new mobile interfaces that are being generated for optimized modal, same kind of thing. You can separate that data, which is JSON, from the template and have a lot of fun and create just beautiful things and make it very dynamic. That's the cool thing about templates is that it's not static. You could have like 10 different represent templates in there on the same JSON data and depending on who the person is, say I'm going to use this template versus this template. Some really powerful things you'll be able to do and we'll have a lot of fun. So a bit of a long-winded, but just rest sure the overall process is going to be very familiar. You're going to connect to these NoSQL databases as you would with a current SQL database or a SQL-oriented database. And the tools are going to work basically the same, but it unlocks if you want to go to that next step and do more templating, you're going to be able to have that ability to do that. That's great. And we did get a clarification on the question about the uh, alpha application. Uh, and the, what they'd like to do is they said, okay, I've seen plenty of your test apps, but had, you know what's actually made it into the into the Apple Store? So I've just pasted a link to one of them, and that's the Alpha Ref Reader, which is probably the first one we posted. Um, and uh, Alpha Ref Reader was meant for reading technical material, um, but the text we used in it was actually the King James version of the Bible because it was very long and it was composed of many books. And it was open source, so we could use it for free in our example. Uh, but I pasted the link to that, and if you want, you can go and grab it uh, on your iDevice and, and check it out. Um, we have some other ones as well, if you'd like to see ones in, for particular industries. I know of customers who have gotten uh, apps up into the store. I'm thinking of ConnectSoft as one. Another one is uh, World Health Card, which was demonstrated at the conference. So if you'd like uh, me to send over examples of those, just go ahead and send an email to guides at alphasoftware.com and I would be happy to point you to ones. Or if you're looking for one for a particular industry, I might be able to dig that up as well. So just let me know. Um, back to a little bit of JavaScript here, and that is how do you assign, and maybe not actually, maybe we do this X basic, but how do you assign the current month uh, name to a control on a UX? Hmm, okay. Um, so you have a UX control, and yep. again, for people who are kind of new to alpha, yeah. that's our form control, and they want to assign a month name to... To a control. Let's say a text control for now. Okay, so let's go ahead and just put in a text box there. We'll go month, name, and you want to do it via JavaScript. 
the uh, actually they don't say specifically JavaScript, so I guess it'll be up to you on this one. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do JavaScript, and then I'm going to show you how to do it through what's called an AJAX callback, and then hopefully we'll solve. They can while they're typing in there, I'll just go ahead and do this. Pick and choose. Sorry. Yep. Okay, we'll do this. We'll go set month name. Okay, so I have a month name, and this is just a text box, and then I have a button called set month name. So when I click this button, what I want to do is, using JavaScript, I want to set the value of this month name. So I'm going to go to that button, set month name. I'm going to scroll down here to the JavaScript touch mouse and pointer events. And you'll notice that there is a click event here. That means when the person clicks on this, it's going to do that. Now, if they're on a mobile platform, that's the same thing as pressing with your finger. It's kind of an equivalent from that standpoint. So I'm going to go ahead and click on there. And you'll notice in here I'm in the Action JavaScript Builder. So I could go in here and start setting up and doing Action JavaScript, but in this case, I'm just going to do some simple JavaScript. So I'm going to go up to the top here and convert from Action JavaScript into text mode. So now what it, you'll notice that the screen changed, and I basically have a full-blown JavaScript editor here. So now I can say, you know, I can do, I can say, you know, var... Uh, month name is equal to uh, March. Okay, so I can just start typing JavaScript. It's color coded. Works out great. Now, what I want to do is we have some built-in JavaScript controls to set the value of controls. Now, I could learn those and go look them up. But if you'll notice in down here, we have a insert UX component method. So I'm going to click on there, and basically it brings up an a, essentially an online library of everything I can do. So I'm going to type in here down below, set value, because I, I kind of know what it is. But you'll notice there, you've got different ones. So it's go, oh, here's dialog object, set value, and then the control name and the value. And then on the right-hand side, you're going to see a set of descriptive help task, test, text, ugh. and then below, an example of what it happens to be. So I'm going to copy this example, and I'm just going to paste it right in here. And I'm going to keep it real simple. I'm going to keep this one here. So as you know, I didn't have to be a super expert. I didn't have to go elsewhere. I could do it all within the tool, which helps it out. So what I want to do is basically how this works is it says dialog.object. So this is our library, set value. And you'll notice in here it's got all in uppercase the name of the field I want to set. Now I could have remembered what that field name is, but the other cool thing about this is I can click right there and hit a space key. And you'll notice that it gives me dynamic help. But if I right click, and what I'm doing is putting my mouse over this black area here, right clicking on it, it's going to show me a list of different fields that are on my interface. In this case, there's only one. So I can go there, month name, and then in here is the value, and that's going to be month name. And again, I can just click there and go. So basically what I'm doing is I'm setting a variable to be March, and then I'm using one of our built-in functions to set the value of that field. So you'll notice the field name is in single parentheses, and then this is the variable that I'm going to set it to. So I could have typed in here Marge, and it would have put that text in there, but I just wanted to show you that it's a full-blown um, JavaScript editor. So let's save that. Let's go ahead and do it in a working preview. And if I set the month name, you'll notice, boom, Marge is set right there. And so this can get very sophisticated, meaning that um, I, I have all of JavaScript. I can use JavaScript libraries, whatever it is. Same kind of concepts here, but you'll see that we have a set of built-in functional capabilities. Um, they're all under uh, this insert UX component method. You can look those up and do from there. So before I go forward, I just want to see if I answered the question for the individual. That was what they were kind of looking for. Mm, yep, it is, in fact. Yep. Great, excellent. All right, well then we'll just uh, yeah. hold there and open up for the next question. Great. Well, let's let's take another similar question, which is, can you make... Soldier on. All right. It's a job. Okay. <laughs> excellent. Can you make a tab label on a UX equal to a session variable? Uh oh Dan, I think, uh, I think you may have jostled something again. I hear your audio seems to have gone out. Or you really don't have the question. Oh, go, okay, you're back. No, I just had like a brain freeze. I was, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks for that question. I'll send you my bill. Um, no, no, I was just feeling for a second. I'm trying to think the best way to do that. Um, I'd have to do a little research. I just don't want to waste a lot of time kind of pecking around on that. Sure. Um, 
I do know one of the nice things about it is that um, more and more just to let you know, and I kind of, uh, I'm going to show more of this in a future demonstration, but let me just show you this real quick. So I'm going to take all of these buttons here. And, and again, this is not going to answer the specific question, so bear with me. But I'm going to go down here to panel cards, and I'm going to put in a um, panel navigator. And then I'm going to put these in a panel card. Okay. And then I'm going to add a new panel card. So for people who are new to this, basically we have what's called a panel navigator, which is a hidden control that will then control what's in the different panel cards below it. Now, the uh, in this case, if I were just to go ahead and go in and show you this working preview, I've got basically, and let me put a little bit of text so it makes sense here, and I'll get to it. Second panel, okay. So basically I've got a panel card with some set of content, then a second one, and I'm using what's called a panel navigator. And a panel navigator will only show one part of it at one time. So if you'll notice in here that I'm using my mouse to kind of swipe back and forth, so that's that first panel card, and here's the second panel card. And the cool thing is everything I've done up to now just works. It all is just content inside of there. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to go to this panel navigator, and right now I'm using what's called a carousel, which that gives that, that swiping effect that you've seen before. But you'll notice that there's other ones in here. And the one I want to put in here is tab band. So I'm going to select tab band, and the location is top, and check this out. I now have the equivalent to tabs. But I'm using panels, which are far more powerful, far more effective for both uh, um, uh, mobile and web applications. They're just much better than tab controls. Tab controls are kind of left over from the desktop. You can simulate a tab control, but you'll notice that we're using panels, which opens up a huge amount of really cool things you can do, uh, including creating dynamic tab panels and other things like that. And again, everything we've done up to now works fine. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find the answer to that specific question, but the idea is you, what you want to be able to do is set this panel card's name to a, the display name. So I'll find out how we would do that and show that next time so we can do that. And it will be very similar to just using a straight tab control. But the idea is they want to be able to set this panel card. So you'll notice when I show the working preview, it just says panel card one. If I change the ID of that, it would change it. But I can actually say first panel by using what's called the display name. So now if I go into working preview, it's got a nice name in here called first panel versus the ID, which I may want to keep as kind of cryptic in nature kind of scenario. So I'll look to see if there's a command that allows you to set this. And then what you can do is then you can just use uh, Ajax callback in some JavaScript to actually dynamically change these panel cards to whatever it happens to be. So maybe, I, I'm guessing, maybe they want to have the name of the customer be the panel card one. You know, So on each panel, you're using the panel to kind of indicate some information and data. But I'll look into that and we'll get back to that. But I just kind of wanted to share the fact that you can use panel cards now with panel navigators as a tabbed interface. And the cool thing about that is that you get a whole amount of new stuff that's built into it because panel cards are far more powerful, more capable than a tabbed user interface or, you know, like a, the tab uh, control that's out there. And uh, again, remember, you can nest these things so you could actually have a sub part of your screen that's like a little tabbed interface that actually is a panel navigator embedded in a larger panel uh, layout setup. And we can show that down the road a little bit more. But I'm sorry, I don't know if I've, I, I know I haven't answered your question, but we'll look into it and try and get a little bit more data for you. Great. Um, let me go and find another couple of questions. I'm looking through. We have a bunch of good ones. Um, oh, also, I did want to mention that the article that you had talked about, the Jason blog article, yeah, oh, yeah. has been posted into the uh, chat window. So you can, if Excellent. you're interested, Excellent. you can look at that. I also put the Alpha Ref Reader uh, link to the iTunes store if anyone's interested in checking that out. Um, here's a Rather quick question. Let me just find it again. Okay. Yeah, just when I thought I had it. Uh, there was a question about taking uh, data from SQL and converting it to JSON data. 
I was wondering if you uh, could yeah. explain a way of doing that. Yeah, there's <clears throat> there's no direct um, method in the system, mm -hmm. meaning that there's not a convert uh, table into it. Um, Alpha actually has a very large set of functions to interact with the database. Uh, a whole bunch of different things that will take like a database table and immediately convert it into a um, uh, a uh, string, a set of strings with a delimiter. But one, of the, and I'm going to give you the hints. I won't. I have the time to show the whole thing. But um, just for this, this is the older control panel. I'm going to go into the new control panel. Do I really want to dive into that right now? But let me kind of explain in pseudocode how I would do it. So let's see. Let me see if I got in there. Okay. Um, here's some code I was just playing around with. And so you'll notice in here that I have some JavaScript right here. And you'll notice it has column, row, size, x, and size, y. So this is just an array of JavaScript uh, J JSON objects. And what's neat is that we can take JSON and populate an array. So we can actually take this and turn it into an array inside the uh, system. And that's what I was explaining is that Alpha has a lot of really cool built-in functions that allow you to take this textual information in JSON and turn it into an array. And the cool thing with an array is that you're now able to very quickly uh, walk through an array and use it in, you know, using array techniques instead of having to do everything on string manipulation. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm taking some JSON, throwing it into an array, and then I'm basically walking through each item in the array and running a, a JavaScript to insert it into a data taste table. This is just kind of a weird sample I was doing for someone a while back. But here is how you would approach that. It's one of the cool things about Alpha, which you'll be able to do, let me go ahead and go back here, hold on there, is I'm going to go um, design it. Um, one of the cool things you could do is like step one is to uh, use the connection to property array statement. Okay. Step two, take the property array and convert into JSON. And that's with A5 underscore JSON. That's property array. So uh, what's it? Var to JSON. Oh, what is that one? Sorry, let me look this up real quick. And then I'll put it on here and then we'll finish up this part. But it's um, alpha 5 var to JSON. Okay. Um, okay. Almost there. There. Okay. And let's see, is it JSON prep or that's the old one? Okay. So what you have is this, uh, and I'll show you a piece of code here is that when you have an array, you can do what's called, um, and actually go back to the right one here, part of JSON. Let me show you this real quick. Okay. So um, let's say you had an array here. Um, you can then turn that array into a set of JSON using a very simple, um, am I still on the right one here? Bar to JSON. Gotcha. So uh, you'll notice in here that I'm able to convert a pointer array into JSON. So it's a two-step process is that I use this really cool feature called connection to property array that it's a database call. Basically, you set up your query. It in it automatically translates whatever is in that, that SQL query into a alpha property array, which is a built-in functional capability. And then we use var to JSON with that property array to uh, into JSON using that. Let me type this right here so it's on the screen. So you, you take the data out of the database, put it into a property rate, and then take that property rate, feed it to var to JSON, and boom, out of it comes JSON, which you can then use, submit, translate, whatever you happen to do with. And it takes a little trial and error, but it's very straightforward there. So that's, a, that's probably the fastest, most efficient way. I don't know of a connection to JSON. Maybe there is one. I should check that. Maybe I'm telling everybody wrong. To JSON. Duh. Never mind. Okay. And I haven't tested this, so 
uh, check this out. Uh, I've used the first one where I go to a property rate and then convert it, but there is a connection to JSON functionality that will literally take JavaScript and turn it right in, uh, take a, a database query and turn that right into a JSON object. But I would play with that. But that's going to be your best bet in terms of uh, performing that. Um, and again, I was I must have been added recently, or well, or I didn't look deep enough. But uh, that's probably going to be your best bet. Because the cool thing about that is that once you've set this up, it does all the heavy lifting for you. Basically, it makes the call to the database, it runs the query, it grabs the data back, and then translates and spits out the other end a text variable that is a is just JSON that you can then start using for whatever you want to do. Excellent. Uh, so I think we have time for one final question. Uh, this one also yeah, is with... obviously someone's after Dave there. Yeah, is that, <laughs> you hear the siren. That's fabulous. <laughs> exactly. That is well, we're going to wrap this up right that, now. That is um, not a special a great time. Got to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this has to do with templates, and uh, but not the uh, uh, JSON template uh, that you were showing before, but the template that you use in a list control on a UX. And they were wondering, how do you how do you do that? How do you set up? They saw that there were some predefined templates, but how do you make your own template if you want to display stuff in a list in a particular way? Oh, good question. So uh, let's see how much time do we have. Yep, yeah, just I'll introduce the concept, but. Um, Basically, the list control, and for people who are new to this, uh, <clears throat> is a um, is a built-in control that allows you to do kind of. It was really built for the mobile. It kind of has. It's basically connects to data, and then you represent that data in a templated fashion. So I'm going to go ahead into the list control real quick, and I'm going to go ahead and say I'm getting it from a SQL database. So I've got my connection string, which is my pointer, and I'm going to do this fast, but this is my pointer to the database. It could be one or many databases. I'm going to look up in there, and it's going to say, oh, I'm going to look at the customer's table. Then I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to pick what fields I want. So I'm just going to pick a sample of the fields right now. Um, and now I can preview that information, and, oh, and then I can go to my list layout, and I can say I want my company name and contact title, do a list control, and you'll see that it's put immediately two columns with company name and contact name. Now that's kind of boring. So what we would rather do instead of using just a traditional column, we can go to my list properties. We can scroll down about halfway to where you see layout properties and layout type. And currently it's set as column, but I'm going to set that to be freeform. So now that I've set that to freeform, when I go back to the list layout, you're going to notice it, all, it, it looks pretty much so like the template tester. And in fact, you can launch the template tester and use it right here to play with it. So just to let you know, that's one of the other reasons I want you to know about that tool is as you get into it, you're going to be using this more and more from there. But you'll notice in here I have a very simple template. So on the left-hand side, I have all the data that's coming back. And on the right side, I have basically a freeform area. So I'm just going to go customer ID, space, and put in company name. So now I have a template for each record it's going to do a customer ID and a company name. So I can do the preview of the list right here. Uh, that looks like, but you'll notice it has the contact I, the ID and the company name. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and put a slash BR, which is a break in HTML. So I'm going to preview the list. Ah, now starting to look a little bit better. You'll notice that it has the, uh, the customer ID and the customer name there. Okay, now I can get, I can have fun. I can start using this. I can say bold, and then I want to put after this slash bold. Okay, so now when I preview the list, you'll see that it's got alpha key and bold in that. And you just go iterative, you know, through those points. And so that's where the template tester is better because you can instantly see what the result is. Uh, but you know, this is handy here now. Built into the tool is some predefined templates, and that's kind of, I think, what the individual is that we have some predefined templates that are already made up here. And so you can select one of these templates here, and then it kind of walks you through and says, okay, level one will be the company name, and level two will be the contact name. And you'll notice now all it's done is pasted a set of pre made. Um, uh, JavaScript and CSS, but you'll notice in there that we still have our company name and contact name 
from the left hand side. So all this predefined template did was just make this go a little faster. So now when I see the preview of the list, you're going to see that I have something that looks a little nicer. It's got a bigger you know, text, a smaller text, and over here, this is an icon that would show up that's like a pointer there. So these are just nice because you can kind of use these as, as templates to start out with. So you can say, oh, I don't really like it that way. I want to change it that way, etc. cetera, uh, and play with it from that standpoint. So the idea is that one, the key thing you want to do is you need to change it from layout time of column to lay, layout type of freeform. And then you have this freeform environment that you can go ahead and just play to your heart's desire and uh, be able to help from, um, and do all those pieces there. And there's other things that are helpful in here. There's some instructions on how to make a dynamic template. Um, which is really cool because you can have one template that like if the name starts with B, make it bold. If not, make it plain. So you have some really fun things you can do there. There's the template tester. There's some instructions on defining hyperlinks, how to embed hyperlinks based on data in your, um, in your list. And then we also have something called template items. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail as we move into the uh, new methodology for creating uh, view boxes and view forms and things like that. But items are kind of live capabilities, so there's some really cool things to go with that. So that is a quick introduction. Did I lose you? I'm not sure if I lost you. Um, it, it jotted me, but it's probably because we're at the end of our session. Yep. And I hope that did answer the person's question a little bit. That's excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have come to the end of our time. I want to thank you, everyone who uh, participated, everyone who asked questions, everyone who attended, and of course you, Dion. Um, Thank you. I'll see you next week at another webinar. If you do have questions in the meantime, send them to guides to UIDES at alphasoftware.com. Thanks again and have a great day.